Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 all the way up to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. In the last episode, we spoke about the beginning of the Northern Expedition. Chiang Kai-shek and the NRA struck first against Wu Pei-fu. Then they attacked Sun Quan Feng, forcing him to join forces with Zhang Zhou Lin to form the NPA. Now the NPA would face off against the NRA to fight a war to reunify China. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave comments on this video to let me know your thoughts and what you want to see in future episodes. But let's get on with the show. This episode is the collapse of the first united front. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know I now have a Patreon account where you can find exclusive Patreon episodes. Cool benefits like early access, Discord perks, getting to choose and vote on new content, and live hangouts with me. Please check out www.patreon.com slash the Pacific War Channel for more details. Wu Pei Fu is utterly defeated and now trapped in Hunan Province. Sun Quan Feng was forced to flee Nanjing as Chiang Kai-shek and the NRA were about to take control of the secondary capital of China. Now it was up to Jiang Zhou Lin to try and help his allies stop the northern expedition. Two major NPA armies emerged, the Shandong army led by Chiang Zongchang, and another led by the Zhu Li clique general, Chu Yupu. Damn, boy! Damn, boy! He thick, boy! That's a thick ass boy! Both armies crossed the Yangtze River in February of 1927 to help Sun defend Nanjing and Shanghai. Following their major victories in Zhejiang, the NRA launched an offensive against both Shanghai and Nanjing. Bai Chongxi and He Yingxin led an NRA force based in Hangzhou to launch a two-pronged attack. He's forces would march towards Changzhou, while Bai's forces would advance straight towards Shanghai. Both forces' goal was to sever the Shanghai-Nanjing Railway, Sun's last lifeline. Meanwhile, another NRA force led by Cheng Qian would strike at Nanjing going through the Anhui province. Many of Sun's troops in southern Anhui simply defected, allowing the NRA quick passage. Now Sun's men and Jiang Songchang were forced to pull back to Shanghai, awaiting the onslaught from Bai's army. Bai's forces quickly seized the railway link with Shanghai, while Sun was confronted with a brand new enemy. His navy had formed a mutiny, and there was a communist uprising going on in Shanghai. Inhabitants of the foreign concessions of Shanghai were in wild alarm. European and American troops with their warships stood ready for what was expected to be a terrible sacking of the city. Bei's army fought a vicious battle at Songjiang, just outside the city, and then marched into Shanghai on March the 22nd. The foreign community of Shanghai was shocked by the NRA's treatment of them and their concessions. After just a day or so, the foreign community was relieved. They began to congratulate Chiang Kai-shek for having a well-disciplined army. But congratulations swiftly changed right back to panic when two days after taking Shanghai, the NRA took Nanjing, and the situation there was quite different. He Yingqin advanced from the southeast, while Cheng Qian came from the southwest. Zhang Songchang did not like the situation at all in Nanjing, and he promptly took his Shandong army the hell out of there by March the 23rd, leaving the city utterly helpless. Cheng Tian's force was the first to arrive on March the 24th, entering the Grand City with zero resistance. Now, why it all happened is still argued to this very day. Regardless, looting and lynching began on the 24th. Many argue it was Zhang Zongchang who had ordered his men to loot the city before leaving, and some of these units simply deserted him, and they were still looting while the NRA showed up. Regardless, as soon as the NRA entered the city, mobs were attacking foreign property and roughing up foreigners. Six foreigners were killed and many foreign women were raped. These murders prompted the American, Italian, Japanese, and British gunboats along the nearby river to gather all the foreigners they could and begin a bombardment. The bombardment devastated the city and killed around 40 people. Chiang Kai-shek himself was on his way downriver by boat from Zhejiang while this was all going down. He would only arrive some days later, and by that time foreigners had already been evacuated to Shanghai. Chiang Kai-shek was livid, and then he found out from his officers that it was claimed Chiang Zongchang's men had been the ones who had done the deeds while fleeing north. 
Hu Yingqin's force had arrived on March the 25th, and by the 26th, alongside Chang's men, they were able to stop all of the violence. Now, a lot of the foreign community had reports from missionaries within Nanjing that they heard many of the perpetrators were speaking with a Cantonese dialect. This prompted Chiang Kai-shek to tell the foreigners he would personally investigate the matter and punish all those responsible. At the same time, Chiang Kai-shek knew the communists within their alliance would not allow him to take Beijing for the KMT alone. Thus, Chiang Kai-shek sought to use the CCP to maintain Soviet support for as long as possible to make sure the northern expedition was a success, but ultimately they would have to face another before the last chess piece fell. And so it was here Chiang Kai-shek felt the time was ripe to make his move. Chiang Zongchang's forces were blamed for starting the attacks on the foreigners, but the NRA was also accused of participating, specifically their communist members. Chiang Kai-shek suspected the CCP and their Soviet advisors had used anti-imperialist and anti-foreign sentiment to instigate the Nanjing incident, and they were yet again conspiring to grab power. Thus, Chiang Kai-shek planned to use this incident as a reason to violently purge the communists from the KMT in Shanghai. Chiang Kai-shek accused communist statesman Lin Bochu of planning the Nanjing incident and he accused the CCP of trying to turn international opinion against the KMT. While all this was happening, the nationalists had moved their Guangzhou government over to Wuhan. But the new government there began to distance themselves from Chiang Kai-shek. In the meantime, the NRA continued its march north to hit the capital of Anhui province, Hefei, while also invading Jiangsu province. The Nanjing incident, however, began to hinder their advance to a grinding halt. This allowed the Fengtian forces to bolster up Sun Chanfang's army before it completely collapsed, and soon, they reorganized themselves to launch a counteroffensive in early April. All of the bickering between the KMT and the CCP was causing the NRA to slowly be driven back 100 miles south of the Yangtze River area by April the 11th. The NRA had finally lost its momentum. The leftists in the national government and the CCP voted Chiang Kai-shek out of the office of Chairman and Generalissimo and appointed Wang Jingwei as the new chairman. Look at little Goblin Jr. Wanna cry? It was expected now that Chiang Kai-shek would simply go to the front lines to lead the troops as a general. Chiang Kai-shek had something else completely in mind. He rushed over to Shanghai under the guise he was tracking down some rioters who had escaped the Nanjing incident. And in Shanghai, Chiang Kai-shek met with Chiang Qingqiang, the leading businessman of Shanghai. Chiang Kai-shek formed a secret agreement with him and other businessmen to acquire 3 million Shanghai dollars to make up for what would be lost in Soviet support now. Then he personally greeted Wang Jingwei when he showed up to Shanghai offering a power-sharing deal with him. Wang Jingwei said politely that he would consider the deal, but quickly made his way over to the nationalist government in Wuhan to convene with the leadership. Before Wang Jingwei had made his way, he spoke with the leader of the CCP, Chen Tixiu, issuing a joint declaration reaffirming the cooperation between the KMT and the CCP. Wang Jingwei then went to Wuhan where he told the government what Chiang Kai-shek had offered him. But on April the 10th, the government decided to turn its limited forces that they had in Wuhan to try and make an offensive north against Beijing on their own. Meanwhile, Chiang Kai-shek unleashed a violent purge of communists at Shanghai. At this time, he was also strapped for men. So in order to find more men, he went to two secret societies that had existed in China for centuries. Chiang Kai-shek declared martial law in Shanghai and issued a proclamation denouncing the Wuhan Nationalist government's policy of working alongside the CCP. Then he gave secret orders to all the nationalist-held provinces under his influence to purge the communists from the KMT. Think Execute Order 66. Beginning on April the 12th, Chiang Kai-shek's gang members struck out at Nanxu, Pudong, and Jiabai. He also ordered the 26th Army to disarm the worker militias to limit resistance. Trade unions were closed, and thousands of students and workers began to protest his crackdown. The soldiers opened fire upon the protesters, killing many, and soon Chiang Kai-shek dissolved the provisional government of Shanghai, all the labor unions, and any other organizations which might have ties to the CCP. 
thousands possibly died. It's hard to know exact numbers. Some sources indicate 1,000 communists were arrested with a few hundred being killed and thousands gone missing. Other sources put the death toll as high as 5,000 to 10,000. Trials were just a summary, if there were any at all. Beheadings took place in streets. It was a real bloody affair, and it is known today as the Shanghai Massacre. Chiang Kai-shek followed the purge up by sending the Wuhan government a list of his demands. All communist propaganda was to stop. NRA soldiers must now only be controlled by regular officers, and that all political agents traveling within the NRA were to be stripped of all of their authority. Basically, it was Chiang Kai-shek telling them he was taking everything. The Wuhan government responded by rejecting all of his demands and publicly voted Chiang Kai-shek out of office again. But this time completely. He was to have no military command, no government posts, or anything within the KMT. They even placed a bounty over his head. So Chiang Kai-shek set up a new government in Nanjing to rival the Wuhan one. Feng Yusheng was a bit shocked by the situation. He didn't know how to proceed. He knew the right course of action was to stick to the northern expedition. But which government would he follow? Wuhan or Nanjing? Both governments were carrying on with their expeditions, but separately. In May, Feng took to Guomingjun, leaving his base in Shangxi to hit Liuyang in Hunan province. The Wuhan government launched a campaign against Hunan province as well, led by their commander-in-chief, Tang Xunzhi. Aided by the defection of the remnants of Wu Paifu's army, Tang Xuzhi was able to advance and face off against an army led by Jiang Xiyang, pushing them as far back as the river area of Yanchang. Meanwhile, Chiang Kai-shek sent the NRA's first and six armies across the Yangtze into Anhui province. By May of the 16th, Li Zongren was taking the NRA's 7th army towards Hefei. Then Chiang Kai-shek unleashed a four-pronged assault through Jiangsu province aimed at Jiang Songchang's Shangdong province. Hu Yingqin led the NRA's first army to capture Jianjiang and then Haizhou. Li Zongren then took Suzhou and then the Guomingjun took Liaoyang. Jiang Songchang was forced to withdraw his forces back into Shangdong province and Jiang Xuliang withdrew his troops north of the Yellow River. Feng Yixiang chased Jiang Xiliang's forces furthermore from Liaoyang towards Zhengzhou. By June the 2nd, the NRA seized the railway junction at Xuzhou. Now the NRA and Guomingjun controlled both the Beijing, Hankou, and Longhai railways. After his successful campaign, Feng Yixiang met with Wang Jingwei and Tang Shengzhi on June the 10th at Zhengzhou. Then he traveled to Shizhou to speak to Chiang Kai-shek on June the 19th. The very next day, Feng made his choice. He decided to align the Guomingjun with Chiang Kai-shek and to purge his forces of the communists. This immediately crippled the Wuhan government's operations to push north, leaving Tang to return to Wuhan with his army. With Feng in the fold, Chiang Kai-shek prepared his forces to make a push into Shandong province, when suddenly a new player entered the mix the Empire of Japan. In June, the Guangdong army had deployed around Qingdao to protect Japanese citizens. Meanwhile, Wu Paifu took the opportunity to retreat with what remained of his army into Sichuan province, where he soon announced his retirement. It seems the jig was up for the once great military mastermind. Tang Shengju, once in Wuhan, decided the only proper course of action going forward was to mobilize against the rival Nanjing government of Chiang Kai-shek. Unfortunately for Tang Xiongju, Chiang Kai-shek was quite aware of this threat, and he recalled all of his forces back from Shandong province, and he took them directly between Wuhan and Nanjing. Meanwhile, the NPA launched their own offensive against Chiang Kai-shek, beginning in early June to reconquer all of their lost territory. By July the 24th, the NPA got their hands back on Chuzhou and its vital railway junction. Now at this point, it had been over seven weeks, and the nationals were in a lot of trouble. The Wuhan government was fighting itself over the question of strategy. Some wanted to push on towards Beijing, others against Nanjing. The Soviets eventually got into the mix. Joseph Stalin argued that the CCP had not become strong enough to be able to defy the KMT yet. The revolution needed to be put on hold because fighting the KMT and the NPA at the same time was simply impossible. 
He advised the CCP to covertly begin purging the KMT hardliners, and to do this gradually, especially any unreliable generals. They needed to be liquidated, and if anyone knew about liquidating, it was Stalin. Anyone who maintained contact with Chiang Kai-shek was to be punished. Wang Jingwei heard the news about the Soviet and CCP's plans, and he was shocked to say the least. Wang Xingwei said his KMT faction would never go along with such disgusting plans. What the fuck is this piece of shit? He then broke with the Soviets and reconciled with Chiang Kai-shek. And soon, the Wuhan government completely purged itself of all of its communists. All of the Soviet advisors were expelled, and the Wuhan government formed a new alliance with the Nanjing government. The new government pointed out that unity could not be achieved as long as Chiang Kai-shek was commander-in-chief, which Chiang Kai-shek agreed upon himself. Thus, on August the 12th, the government asked Chiang Kai-shek to voluntarily submit to a demotion, but he promptly resigned altogether. He simply walked out of a meeting, took a 200-strong bodyguard, and he took up quarters in a Buddhist monastery on a high mountain. Well, all right, let's go over everything we now just learned. The KMT-CCP First United Front has collapsed. The nationalist government was divided between Wuhan and Nanjing. Chiang Kai-shek stepped down and allowed Wang Jingwei to unify the divided nationalist governments in the hopes of continuing the northern expedition. Really hope you liked this episode. Please leave a like, subscribe, and a comment as it helps this very small but growing channel. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.